my mom was a pediatric nurse, and, uh, and so if she didn't have anybody to like watch me on the weekend, she would just like bring me uh, to, you know, to work with her. You know, it was a pediatric floor, there was a lot of kids there that I would make friends with and then they would eventually die over and over and over and over and over again. Um, that was my life. And, and all the other nurses were like psyched that like, you know, Barbara's kid is here, so they'd always give me jobs to do. My main job was delivering blood to the lab. <laughs> which breaks my mind now. <laughs> like now, in order to touch blood in a hospital, you have to be in like a space suit, you know? They just like, I was just like six years old and they just handed me a hot bag of blood. And I was like, I'm on an adventure. <laughs> My parents were born the same year, next door to one another, in the Lower Ninth. They grew up knowing each other since birth, and they started dating when they were like 14, okay? And it ruined me, destroyed me. I, they, their, their relationship turned me into a little romance bitch, you know? Just weeping all the time. Like a fatter version of Cupid, just firing hot dog darts that would just deflect off of every woman I fell in love with every 48 hours. You understand? You think being ghosted is bad? Try not getting a response to handwritten poetry over and over again. What do you think has to happen in a person's life to make them want to buy eyelashes for their car. <laughs> like who hurt you? Did a car hurt you? Yeah. Now it's my friend. <laughs> It'll never hurt me again. <laughs> who is the audience for this? Is it for the driver's amusement? Do they walk up to their car? every day, like, <laughs> still a face. Sometimes we'll go out with one of my wife's friends and then just some guy that they're dating. <laughs> like her friend's boyfriend. I don't know this man. I don't want to talk to this man, but he's at the table. We're staring at each other. It's a lot like trying to get two dogs to get along. My wife's just like, Ryan, huh? Ryan, Ryan, huh? That's Andrew, huh? Andrew's also a man, huh? Yeah, he's a good boy. He's a good boy. You're a good boy. Andrew's a good boy. There's something wrong with the water. <laughs> I want to be really, really confident tonight. I wish I had the confidence of one of these guys who just crosses the road whenever they want. You know these guys? They don't care about the traffic lights. They don't even care about cars. They'll give a car a smack. <laughs> you know these guys? They've got a little head and a big ass. <laughs> Walking across the highway at peak hour, often accompanied by a weird mate. Come on! <laughs> Oi! I'm not like that. I'm not like you. I'm really insecure. I've actually never, I've still never, I've, I've actually never crossed the road, ever. In my life, I've still never, I live on top of this building. I've never been across Anzac Parade. I long to go. I want to go to Sydney Boys High School, see what they're up to. I want to go to Sydney Girls High School, see what... I just want to see what everyone's up to, okay? Is that wrong? What, I'm not allowed to see? What, is it illegal for me to see what people are up to? <laughs> this is exciting. I saw a woman wearing a T-shirt. It said, Sam Campbell rules. I thought, wow, how about that? Sam Campbell rules. But then I looked underneath it said, rule one, keep him away from me. <laughs> rule two, I don't want him going anywhere near my handbag. <laughs> rule three, capture him, put him in a gulag. <laughs> Rules, bureaucracy. 
This is a vicious industry. <laughs> I'm not well liked on the comedy scene. They don't like me. They hate my guts. Well, they, they resent my faith. <laughs> I've heard them talking about me. Yeah, these comedians think they're so cool. Cooler than the Christ child? <laughs> I know what they're saying. Oh, here he comes. The God botherer. I beg your pardon? What does that even mean? God? You think I'm bothering God? If I'm bothering him so much, why did he sacrifice his only son upon the cross to forgive my every sin? <laughs> I don't think I'm bothering him. I think he loves me unconditionally. God is good. God is really good. He likes me. <laughs> all day I've been practicing my routines. I try out all my stuff on my guinea pig. <laughs> I'm the caregiver to a beautiful little pet guinea pig. But my guinea pig only likes topical humor. My guinea pig <laughs> likes topical gags. I think it's because I line its cage with newspaper. So... <laughs> Doing renovations on the Opera House. Got anything on that? <laughs> so many animals drink up. Guinea pig drinks down. <laughs> From a sort of long metal teat. <laughs> Will we ever understand the world of rodents? <laughs> Do you remember that mouse? Remember that famous mouse? Scientists got a mouse, they grew a human ear on its back. <laughs> get this, that mouse just turned 15. It wants to get the ear pierced. <laughs> it wants to get the hoop earring. It wants to go to schoolies with Tamara. She's a bad influence. <laughs> Tamara? That's where they put a bit of a human on an animal's back. Sometimes they put an entire human on an animal's back. <laughs> what about these jockeys? <laughs> Have you seen them? Do you like them? They're jockeys. I don't mind them. A lot of jockeys come to my shows. <laughs> they don't get any recognition. The horses steal all of the limelight. It's got to be frustrating. At the end of the race, you hear, and the winner is Mr. Razzle Dazzle. <laughs> and you hear, and Gavin. <laughs> I was involved. Hey, who's that little fellow with the polka dot hat? Don't worry about him. He's not important. <laughs> oh, I like your shirt. <laughs> what is that? It was a jumper. What is that? Is it shirt? It's a hoodie. It's a hoodie. Ah. What, is it? what does it say? It says vediments. What's it? Vediments. Vediments. <laughs> oh, is that vediments? <laughs> Is that the cross between a vitamin and a, a veteran? <laughs> okay. Veterans probably like to have vitamins. <laughs> After all, they've been through. <laughs> That's a great term. We've got to destigmatise crowd work! <laughs> I'm trying to talk to this lady. You think I like a stupid fucking hoodie? It's the worst hoodie I've ever seen! <laughs> kill you! <laughs> if I could, I'd kill everyone here. I've got a grenade in my rucksack. <laughs> you don't want to turn up to heaven just by yourself. You, you want to rock up with a crew! <laughs> St. Peter, we've got a party of 150. <laughs> I don't know if you can tell, but I went to get a key cut this week. <laughs> I needed a spare key and I did something about it. I went down to the shopping centre kiosk. A friend of mine is coming to stay from out of state. All week I was thinking, I've got to get this key cut, I need this key. I took my key off the key ring. I wanted to have it ready. I accidentally left my key on the kitchen table. I went down there, I didn't have the key. I said, I'm sorry, I forgot the key. This key cutter, it was remarkable. He said, just describe it to me. <laughs> I said, well, it's very much in your classic style. <laughs> Beginning at the tip of the key, it goes up, down, up, down. Kind of flat lines for a while, not much going on. Up, down, up, down, then the shape. Up, down, up, down. A few nibbles, up, down, up, down, strong finish. 
He made this key. It was amazing. I mean, it didn't work. But <laughs> the fact that he gave it a crack. It's tough being a key cutter. It's not easy cutting keys. You can't make an honest living cutting keys. You can't feed a family cutting keys. Go to a careers advisor and tell them you want to be a key cutter. They'll say, no way, it's not going to happen. Unless you also learn to repair shoes, fix watches, do custom engravings, and hang up way too many Swiss Army knives. Yeah, all right. A lot of Swiss Army knives with the NRL team logos on the handles. I, uh, I've been thinking about getting a haircut which is a, a slightly different thing. <laughs> oh, I don't know, it's tough. Two people have demanded that I get a haircut. My mum and a guy I don't know who drove past. <laughs> Threw an empty can at me. <laughs> I'm hesitant, I'm hesitant. The last time I got a haircut, it wasn't a very pleasant experience. I didn't enjoy it. I had one of these unfaithful barbers. My barber had something of a wandering eye. <laughs> He's cutting my hair, he says, so, what are you up to on the weekend? I said, I'm putting together my application for a reptile license. He said, yeah, right, what about you? He's talking to the guy getting a haircut in the chair next to mine. That's not allowed, that's not appropriate. You talk to me. This guy, this Yahoo goes, this weekend, yeah, might be going down to the golf course. My guy says, golf. I can't believe you like golf. I myself am an avid golfer. They start talking all about golf. I said, excuse me, I exist. <laughs> what are you playing at? You don't go diagonal, you go down. <laughs> you're not a bishop, you're a rook. <laughs> I didn't know you could feel so incredibly lonesome while someone is gently touching your head. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me keep any of the hair from the floor. <laughs> I said, give me some of that floor hair. They said, what do you want with the floor hair? I said, that's private. I got yelled at the show recently. This guy goes, hey, buddy, that's a trigger word. I was like, whoa, I think it's pronounced trigger. <laughs> <laughs> Easy there, big fella. And look, I, you know, if you get upset or offended, that's cool. I'm not one of those guys. You're allowed to be offended. That's totally cool. But if you are, just shut up. <laughs> You're not a hero, you're just ruining a show. Just be offended, just let it flow through you. Just feel it, right? Yeah, don't share, we don't care, just feel, yeah. We all have thoughts, I might wanna sleep with your girlfriend. I just hold it in, I don't say it, you know, yeah. Yeah, just feel it. We're so obsessed with words now. It kinda shows how good we have, we gotta focus on words, you know? Like, in the 70s, it was all about actions. Like, if you wanna show you're brave in the 70s, you had to jump over 12 buses on a motorcycle. Now I see a guy make an off-color joke at the office, I'm like, that guy's fucking fearless. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I don't know. People take things so seriously. I guess they got to show you their personality by yelling at you about stuff that bothers them. I don't know. Like, I don't mean any of this stuff. I'm just saying words in a certain order to elicit laughter. People, like, try to figure me out through my act. It's all jokes. I told an abortion joke recently, and a woman approached me. She was like, hey, that's very insensitive. I've had an abortion. You shouldn't tell jokes like that. I was like, whoa, hey, sorry. I just told a joke. I think what you did was much worse. <laughs> But, you know, either way, I'll see you at home later, honey. <laughs> and again, all jokes. I love abortions. I paid for two last week. I'm a fan, right? <laughs> you remember? Come on. It's all jokes. A friend of mine, she works at Planned Parenthood. She loves that joke. And I was like, ah, I might have to get rid of it. People don't like it. She's like, no, no, you got to keep it. I was like, ah, I might get rid of it. She's like, no, no, you got to keep it. I was like, ah, I might get rid of it. She's like, no, no, you got to keep it. I was like, ah, I might get rid of it. I was like, don't tell me to do with my body of work. She's like, every joke's a miracle. <laughs> but I don't want to upset anybody, you know? Ah, oh, jeez. I don't want to upset. That's not my intention, you know? I'm upsetting people on accident now. I was at a Starbucks recently. This guy handed my coffee. I went, hey, thanks, chief. This guy goes, ooh. <laughs> don't say chief. It's offensive to Native Americans. I was like, how is that offensive? He goes, whoa, don't say how. <laughs> Come on! How do we get here? Weird times, weird times. Taking words away, you know, I get it. You know, words hurt people, I get it, you know. But here's the thing. We're kind of in like a weird word prohibition. Can't say this, can't say that. That's why I feel like every now and then we should all go to a politically incorrect speakeasy. Just somewhere we can all go to say horrible stuff and nobody cares. You got no hate in your heart, you don't want to hurt anybody, but if you can't say it there, give us a place you can, right? 
You go down some creaky stairs, you bang on a big steel door, the guy's like, what's the password? Retarded. Get in here! <laughs> All right. It's like the 90s again, you know? Because offensive words, they're like alcohol. Sure, you can abuse it. Sure, you can hurt people. If you do it responsibly, it's a good time, yeah? <laughs> Just don't do it at work. Don't do it around kids, but go home, close the door, take the edge off. Ah, midget. <laughs> Right? I don't want to say little people. That's like drinking no duels. <laughs> but of course I get it. I just, you know, find it funny. I get it. But here's the problem. We forget that no one's politically correct up here. We're all animals. You know, we're all trying to, we're all seeing the same thing. We're all thinking the same thing. No one's PC in their brain. That's just a filter you put on when you talk so you seem nice. Like no one sees a hot girl bend over and thinks, look at that independent woman. I like to treat her equally. <laughs> no, we're sick, men and women. We're gross. But look where it's all gotten us. Doesn't it feel like the whole country's pent up? Feels like everybody's angry right now. We got white supremacists, protests, hate groups. It's weird you're allowed to be hateful in America as long as you're not specific. Isn't that weird? You know, if you're like, I hate Mexican people, everybody's like, oh my God, what a bigot, prejudice. But if you're like, I hate people, everybody's like, ha, fucking right. <laughs> Isn't that worse? People are angry now, man. I had one of those uh, White Lives Matter rallies go by my house the other day. I freaked out, then I realized, oh, it's just a half marathon. <laughs> That was close. I don't know. Just be a good person. What about that? Just be nice to people, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, a lot of it doesn't add up. I can't keep track of all the rules. Like, transgender, what do you think? <laughs> That's how I feel. I don't give a shit. You, know? <laughs> you want to go for a man, a woman? Go nuts. Well, go labia. <laughs> What's the beef? Look, it's weird to hate someone because they're trans, right? But it's also weird to love someone because they're trans. Shouldn't you like them based on who they are as a person, content of the character? People are so phony. I love Caitlyn Jenner. Why? She sucks. <laughs> She's against gay marriage or ran over a person. What's the good part? <laughs> then they go, well, they have hard lives. All right, well, so do midgets. <laughs> Why don't you talk about how much you like them? Where's that hashtag? I don't see any tweets about midgets. Who's got a hard on a midget? Hard to get around, hard to drive, hard to get work? No love. And look, I'm not anti-trans, but I am pro-midge. <laughs> I just don't get why we help one group and not another. It's just kind of trendy. And people say, well, trans aren't allowed everywhere. Well, you ever been to a roller coaster? Oh. <laughs> At least trans we accommodate with the bathrooms. Midgets, you ever seen how tall a toilet is? What? Imagine having a jump to take a dump. <laughs> Weird. No help, no support. And you know what's great about midgets? I got a couple midget friends. They're good eggs. You never see a midget complaining. Never. Every other group complains. Never a midget. Never see it on the news, sitting at a desk, legs dangling, a little fish shaking. <laughs> Never. Every other group complains. I see women on the news. We have a glass ceiling. Midgets are like, you're worried about the ceiling? Holy shit. <laughs> I'm trying to fuck with this counter, baby. <laughs> Interesting. See, I guess I'm too open-minded, because I support all transition, not just sexual. Why do we stop at sexual? I support transition of personality, transition of uh, opinion. Right, like Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart got in trouble with some offensive tweets from years ago. Well, I'm not the same guy I was from years ago. I've transitioned. I used to have sex with 16-year-olds when I was 16. <laughs> now I don't. I'm different. Well, years ago, he said some offensive stuff. Well, years ago, she won the men's relay. People change. Right? <laughs> Why do you support that and not that? Huh. It just tells me if I ever get into trouble now, I'm just going to get a sex change because you got to kiss my ass. <laughs> hey, Mark, we heard that interview from 10 years ago. <laughs> that was Mark. I'm Margaret. <laughs> I don't know. I support Kevin Hart also because he's a midget. <laughs> now I'd like to talk about race. <laughs> I'm a straight white, and uh, I'm coming out of the closet straight white. I don't know if we have a closet. We have more of a wine cellar. <laughs> but sometimes, admittedly, I only see things from my straight white perspective. For example, I went to Aruba before the dark times without my significant partner, which is what Twitter makes me call my girlfriend now. And I needed somebody to rub sunblock on me. And I know what you're thinking, that's a straight white problem. But if you're a straight white without your intimate partner, who do you ask? Another straight white? The answer is no, because we don't help each other. 
Do you ask the straight white's wife? Now you gotta fight the straight white. We're a jealous group. Can't ask a kid. I think Epstein ruined that for all of us. I asked my friend who's an African-American woman, I'm like, will you please rub sunblock on me? She goes, sunblock, Michael, is racist. I go, how so? She goes, it's a product, Michael, that's dedicated to keeping you white. I couldn't wrap my straight white brown. I couldn't. I couldn't wrap my straight white brain around it. And then she goes, and, and you could tell the level of racism by the SPF. <laughs> SPF 5 is a little bit racist. SPF 40 is Nazi strength. <laughs> she goes, give me one reason I should rub this sunblock on you, Michael, one reason. I go, melanoma? <laughs> that was her name, Melanoma Jenkins. But I am against discrimination in all of its forms, okay? I was on the beach uh, in Aruba, same joke. And um, there's these children building a sandcastle, so I examined it very carefully because I'm a thoughtful person. And then I kicked it over <laughs> with tears in their eyes. They were like, sir, why? And I was like, because you do not have any wheelchair accessible entrances. <laughs> this is a castle of discrimination, you little pieces of trash. And I told that joke to an audience full of people in wheelchairs, and they actually gave it a standing ovation. So you guys have a, you guys have a lot of work to do. But to be honest, guys, um, with what's going on today, I just kind of, um, I kind of do whatever fits my own narrative. Like I have a white friend who goes, uh, standardized testing is racist. And I actually agree with that because I do not do well on my SATs. <laughs> so I go, yeah, I agree. He goes, it doesn't apply to you, Mike, because you're a straight white. I go, it does apply to me. If the test is racist and I'm not a racist, I'm not going to do well on it. <laughs> I go, what did you get on the SATs? He goes, 1580. I missed one question. I go, good job, Hitler. Now I'd like to talk about God. <laughs> I am Catholic. Anybody? Yeah. Well, for the rest of you guys who are going to hell. <laughs> when you're Catholic, what you do is you go to church, you light a candle, and you say a prayer. But I'm a very competitive Catholic, so before I light my candle, I blow everybody else's candle out. <laughs> So I don't want God getting confused between the nonsense prayers and the ones that are very important. I think even if you're an atheist, you have to admire Jesus as a historical figure. You know, I think he was great and I don't think he deserved his death, you know? All he did was, um, you know, cure leprosy, um, wash people's feet and just like multiply loaves of bread and turn water into wine. I mean, the guy was a walking after party, basically. <laughs> and he did not deserve his death, you know? And you know who else didn't deserve their deaths? Um, the guys who were crucified next to Jesus. They were criminals. They were horse thieves. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you guys that stealing a horse is the right thing to do. <laughs> it's not. But it's not crucifixion wrong. Even for Roman times, that's a bit harsh. That's why in the Bible, there's so many letters to the Romans. People were writing in, dear Romans, how about you stop crucifying people for class three misdemeanors? You ever hear of community service Romans or house arrest? 
Now the story goes, there's a bitter horse thief and a contrite horse thief, and we're all supposed to be like the contrite horse thief and ask for forgiveness. But I actually understand the bitter horse thief. <laughs> the bitter horse thief had a lot to be bitter about because he's being crucified with Jesus, who has a huge following, even at that time, you know? So Jesus got all the headlines, and Jesus got all the merch. Let's face it. I've never been wearing a cross and had someone come up to me and go, which guy was that? Was that the horse thief? Now, miss, have you been to Israel? Not yet. Well, I went over there before the dark times. Did I learn Hebrew? No, I didn't. But I looked at it a lot. And the language of Hebrew just looks like somebody is repeatedly trying to draw a footstool over and over again. It just looked like footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, footstool flipped over, footstool flipped over, footstool, one leg of a footstool, flipped over footstool, half a footstool, one leg of a footstool, 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 half a footstool. I just wish you guys a happy Easter. I know, uh, Hebrew, I just wish you guys a happy Easter. I think Jesus had a bad lawyer. Because it was after his trial, you know, and he's waiting for the verdict, and his lawyer comes back and goes, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Which would you like first? And Jesus goes, I'm about the good news, so give me the good news. And the lawyer goes, they've decided on crucifixion. And Jesus goes, that's the good news? What's the bad news? The lawyer goes, the bad news is the Romans have a union, and the union has a contract with the state to perform the crucifixion. But they do not have a contract with the state to carry the cross to the crucifixion site. <laughs> Jesus goes, why are you telling me this? The lawyer goes, they want to pay you a non-union wage to carry the cross, you know? Jesus goes to the lawyer, he goes, uh, who are these people that are doing this to me? And the lawyer goes, they're the Romans, but later they will become Italians. And if it matters in the future, they're gonna be way into you. They're really super into your birthday. And they're gonna put nativity scenes with your whole family on their front lawn. And if anybody messes with them, they'll flip out and it'll make the newspaper. And Jesus goes, Italians, huh? Well, how about this? Everybody in their ethnicity, all the men in their ethnicity have hair on their back for the rest of eternity. All their women have mustaches. All their kids live with their parents until they're 40. And when they do move out, they move next door. How's that? Is that fun? <laughs> Tell him it's from the King of the Jews. Here's another thing that starts happening to women as we get older. And there's, there's shame attached to it. As there is with, with any change in a woman's body, there's shame attached to it. We get our periods. Shame. We hit the menopause. Shame. And here's another thing we're supposed to feel ashamed about. And I'm not going to bloody feel ashamed about. And I'm going to talk about it. It's a taboo subject. I'm not supposed to mention it. But I'm going to mention it. Why? Because I'm a bloody maverick. Okay? Okay? <laughs> right, here's something that happens to some women. Okay? As we hit our 40s, 50s, as we hit the menopause, we wake up one morning, and out of the blue, we've got a little cheeky beard. Okay? <laughs> We've got ourselves a little goatee. Now listen, it's not, do you know, and it's not even a beard that we could be fucking proud of, yeah? Wouldn't it be great if you could spot a menopausal woman because she looked just like Brian Blessed? Wouldn't that be great? Vera, I love what you've done with your sideburns, sweetheart. A little bit of glitter, yes, please. You could be any witness that you want to be. I started doing comedy in Ohio when I first started. Uh, my friends and I, you're always a broke person as a comedian looking for ways to make money well my one friend told me about this thing where you can uh, sue somebody on court television and the the court show actually pays whoever wins uh, and it doesn't go on anybody's record so we started just making up cases to sue each other 
and then just split the money and make sure the plaintiff wins. Uh, I was a witness on Judge Alex. <laughs> My team won, uh, and I'm glad we won because I needed the money at the time. Man, I'm just glad we got this money. I needed the money so bad I'm broke. I have like three frozen hamburgers at home. I can't afford to buy toothpaste. You could be any plaintiff that you want to be. I was on Judge Joe Brown as a plaintiff. You can be any defendant that you want to be. I was on Judge Alex again as a defendant. I went a few years later. I used my middle name to slip past the producers. And this one I played a, a promoter. Uh, I was supposed to promote my friend's Battle of the Beards contest and I kind of just blew him off and didn't do anything. Uh, and when I got to court, I really didn't have much of a defense at all either. And Judge Alex was not impressed with me. To me, I just think things, communication was failed. Uh, communication was failed? I agree. What does that even mean? It's, I don't know. I just think it was just a misunderstanding. And I don't, I don't understand why it's got to be like this. How much weed do you smoke? <laughs> uh, you could be uh, any journalist that you want to be. Uh, this is a, a company called uh, Monet. Uh, they're a multi-level marketing company, aka a pyramid scheme, uh, where the only people who make money that work for them are the people at the top of the pyramid, all the executives. Everyone else just ends up wasting a bunch of time or losing money, actually. Uh, in addition to being one of these companies, uh, they've also been known for making people lose their hair. Yeah, they have like skin products that were making people lose their hair. So I emailed them uh, and pretended to be a reporter from a newspaper I made up called the Colorado and Times. <laughs> Signed, my name is Jackie Jones. I emailed them uh, a meme I made of their CEO. I photoshopped him bald and said, if you like the Vin Diesel look, you should try our hair products because they'll make you bald. <laughs> Uh, they wrote back and said, it's absolutely, unequivocally not from their CEO. So I said, okay, uh, we'll make note that he didn't say anything about Vin Diesel. However, we do have something Vin Diesel said about him. And I said, we can share that with you too before we run our story. They're like, yes, we absolutely want to see that story, in quote, before you run it. So I was like, okay, yes, this is directly from Vin's reps. I've relied on Monat to keep me bald for years. <laughs> So, so I, after this email, uh, the next email I got was from their lawyers. Uh, and they sent me a multi-page demand letter. Uh, I mentioned Vin Diesel like six times. Uh, and, and they said that uh, you can tell it's not their CEO by a simple Google search. They said if Jackie or the Colorado Times publishes this, they'll take swift legal action. And then they gave me a deadline to confirm that I won't publish this. And then they said, they said if you have any questions or, or want to address this issue further, please contact us or have your attorney do so. So I had my attorney do so. <laughs> I wrote them and said, on January 28th, 2021, you threatened to take swift legal action. I'm reaching out to inform you that if you take any legal action against Jackie or their Colorado and Times, even just a tiny hair of legal action, <laughs> I'll respond by photoshopping every Monad executive bald. These photos will be posted on the internet and made easily accessible by a simple Google search. In addition, I'll get in touch with every bald celebrity to ask them if they'd be interested in promoting Monad. And that list includes, but is not limited to, Pitbull, Charles Barkley, Samuel L. Jackson, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Larry David, Seal, Terry Crews, and the Dalai Lama. You have until Friday, January 29th, 2021 at 8.59 a.m. Mountain Standard Time to read this email. That time has already passed. <laughs> if you have any questions or wish to address this issue further, please do not hesitate to contact a Jones. Sincerely, Jackie Jones. Jones, Jones, and Jones, LLC. Attorneys at Law. You mess with Jones, you get the Jones.
<laughs> So I shared this online and uh, someone saw it, I guess, and then they sent me a link to a Zoom party that all of the executives, all the people at the top of the pyramid at Monat were having together. So I joined uh, as Trey Angle. Uh, and it got a little awkward in there. And I see one face I don't recognize. Who is Mr. Angle? Hey, I'm, I'm Trey. And they removed Trey from the meeting. <laughs> so I tried rejoining. I changed my name really quick and tried to rejoin and they let me back in. <laughs> so I was able to say, You mess with the Jones? You get the Jones. <laughs> <laughs> you could be anything. <laughs> you know, uh, it's crazy. I've been doing comedy uh, actually 14 years uh, ago. Around 14 years ago, I started doing stand up comedy. Uh, and then, yeah, thanks. Then I started pretending to be other people, all these things. Um, and I've always wanted to be a professional stand up comedian. That was the thing I wanted to be the most. So, by pretending to be all these things, eventually I think I did become the thing I wanted to be most. And that's because all of you are here. Yeah. Thank you. You validated me. I made it. I made it. I, I, just, I don't know. I just you, do you know you know how you know how procreation works, right? No. You know that there's like a million sperm that go swimming towards that one egg, competing to see which one can fertilize that egg. Yeah. I am I made amazed it. that yours won. Yeah. <laughs> My biggest regrets stem from alcohol. When I was in college, I used to take shots of gin and chase them with deli meat. <laughs> Yeah. You know you're white trash when your cocktails involve ham. You ever look in a cockpit? It's a panic room. It's just a chamber. It's a chamber of anxiety for anybody that doesn't know. And they know. They know. All the buttons, all the switches. They know what to do. The windshield, that's arbitrary. That's for us. If a pilot sees something wrong out the windshield, we're dead. We're already dead. Like that. That, nobody's gonna get on a plane without a windshield. That's for you guys to feel all right. If something's going wrong out there, we're fucked, man. We're just straight up fucked, I'll tell you that. <laughs> At the beginning, ever, they get in there and just know, they're like, the, every switch, like, don't die, don't die, don't die, will not die. We won't die here, won't die if I do that. Better not die, better not die, better not die. <laughs> oh, here's the big old good luck lever, we need that. Don't die, shit, almost, if I didn't do this, we would have definitely died. <laughs> Fuck, thank God, don't die. And here we go, not dying. <laughs> And then we all just hung over, shuffling off like the landing was a little choppy, I don't know. Yeah, I feel like we know each other well enough to tell you all about my parents' divorce. <laughs> Listen, if you thought this was the product of a happy home, <laughs> you need to readjust your expectations, all right? <laughs> they finished the process of getting divorced when I was about 15, 16 years old, and I was very surprised because I always thought divorce was some rich people shit. <laughs> I heard my parents were splitting up, and my reaction was, wow, the family's doing better than I thought. <laughs> you two can get divorced, but you can't get me a PlayStation. I see how it is. This is... <laughs> and if anything, my, my life got a lot easier after they got divorced, really, uh, because I, I, I was, I'm the eldest kid in the house. I have two little sisters, so I'd be the one mediating their fights very often. And after they split up, they could only fight over text message, so I got to be like a diplomat during the Cold War, just relaying messages between these two assholes. <laughs> Like, hey, Russia, can you not call America a dumb bitch before noon? That's my, that's my mother you're talking to. Uh, but when they were together at home, they, they were very violent with each other. They fight all the time, and I have to get involved. Like, as young as like 13, 14 years old, I'd stay up at night and listen to them fighting. And if it got too loud, I'd go up to the door and look through the keyhole and see if it got physical. And if I saw a hand getting raised, I'd just, just rush in there like a little referee and push them apart. Like, come on, guys, let's have a nice, clean fight tonight, all right? <laughs> No closed fists, no uncut nails, open hand only. Will Smith rules in this house. <laughs> Show some decorum, this is silly. <laughs> I, always, I always took my mother's side because I, I love an underdog. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but mostly we, we had a much easier relationship at the time. You know, because uh, my dad, I, I think any anger he couldn't take out on my mom. I was the only other guy in the house, so he took it out on me. He used to hit me a lot. Uh, it really upset me at the time. It still does. You know, I'm not, I haven't quite forgiven him for it. I have a little bit more empathy for it as I've gotten older. You know, he, he was around my age, like a bit only a bit older than me. He had three kids. He was dealing with a lot. I, I feel like a grown man doesn't hit a kid half his size because everything's going well for him in life. <laughs> Well, people do strange things when they're having a hard time. If I'm having, having a terrible week and I see a flock of pigeons just minding their own business, I'll just check if the coast is clear and chase them around for a little bit. Uh, assert my dominance over nature, you know? It's, and it wasn't too bad. My grandmother always lived with us, so whenever my dad would get at me, I would run through the house into my grandmother's room and hide behind her and wait till he came in and give him the finger from behind his own mother. <laughs> I felt very powerful. Uh, and a part of me is happy that I had both of those influences growing up. I feel like anyone that ever amounted to anything had someone in their childhood that made them feel very special, and that was my grandma, and someone that made them feel like a piece of shit, and that was my dad. <laughs> I don't think we would have ever heard of Michael Jackson if his dad, Joe Jackson, didn't treat him terribly. Because you know who Joe Jackson was nice to? Tito. <laughs> and half of you are wondering who the fuck Tito is. <laughs> That's my point exactly. <laughs> it, got, it got a lot easier after I hit puberty, though, because then I grew to r around his size. I feel like any son that's had trouble with a violent dad remembers the first time you blocked his punch. That shit feels amazing. <laughs> you feel like you're in Dragon Ball Z, you just block that shit. And then the thought crosses your mind like, oh shit, I can kick this old man's ass. And then you remember that he still pays for everything in your life and you let him continue. I was like, oh shit, Wu-Tang is right. Cash does rule everything around me. This is very irritating. That's why since I've, I was a kid, I've always viewed having some money, uh, uh, financial independence as freedom, in a way. Like, if I could get a job and get out of Sri Lanka and get away from this guy, I'd be safe by myself. You know, like I can't wait to have so much money that I forget where I came from. That's where I'm, I want that amnesia money. I want, I want that Preeti Patel money where I turn my back on my people altogether. <laughs> altogether. Strange thing to clap for, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, because people say they have principles, but everybody's got a price. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, mine is not that high. Is, so you throw me a few grand, I'll go to the beach and kick back refugee boats myself. Like, not today, you broke motherfuckers. These are my white people. Uh, I got here first, finders keepers. This is... <laughs> I told you not to clap. This is... <laughs> Yeah, the, fir the first place I, uh, I left uh, Sri Lanka for, I went to medical school uh, in, in Malaysia. I went to medical school because since I was a kid, I've always been very passionate about financial stability. Uh, <laughs> why else would you do this terrible profession? Yeah, I learned that at a very young age. You know, I feel like it's unavoidable growing up in Sri Lanka. Uh, you learn at a very young age to dream practically, you know, like aim lower. Uh, I <laughs> Remember when I was a kid, I, I'd say, uh, want to do dumb things. I, like, what I thought was dumb at the time. I told my parents once that I want to be a chef. And they looked at me and said, as far as the world is concerned, boy, you're a cook. And <laughs> that sounds very harsh in a way, but I really feel like they were protecting me. I, I really do. And just to iterate their point, my dad sat me down and put on Ratatouille for me, <laughs> which I thought was a beautiful, uplifting film. But he was like, no, really, really watch this. This, this film takes place in Paris a city full of immigrants, just like you're going to be when you leave home. And who got the job? A French rodent, all right? This is where you stand. Why did he get it? Because he knew the owner's son. This is what you're up against. This is... That's an important lesson to learn at a young age. I feel like some people's parents lie to them and tell them that they're special and they can be anything they want to be and it'll all work out. And that's just not true. That's how people leave the house thinking they're going to be a CEO and are disappointed when they end up a project manager. You know, like musician, barista, <laughs> DJ. DJ. That, ooh, that's... Not everyone I was in school would quite agree with me. I had a few people uh, in my class would say things like, you know, you shouldn't worry about all that. You shouldn't worry about employment. You know, you should just, just go with the flow. You know, just go with the flow and the universe will provide. 
And to that, I say that the universe is a very strange nickname for your rich parents. I don't know how it works. That's a strange relationship, it sounds like. I envy them, though. I wish I grew up with money so I had this sort of level of confidence where I could just say dumb shit with enough charisma that it sounds profound. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to do things that contradict themselves and feel okay about it. I want to do things like, like uh, be vegan, but do coke every weekend. Because... <laughs> because cow's lives are very important. Colombians, not so much, apparently. This is... Uh, <laughs> oh, you know, these are the same sorts of people that say things like, like money won't solve all your problems. You know, money won't, this is some shit that, <laughs> that only someone that has always had money would say. Because if you've been broke, you know that at a certain level of brokenness, money solves literally all of your problems. <laughs> 100% of them. Uh, so I went to medical school. It's a very strange situation. It was Newcastle University in the UK set up this very sketchy twinning campus in Malaysia. And I remember them advertising it in Sri Lanka and the banners read, first world education at a third world price. <laughs> and I was like, oh shit, that's my whole vibe. That's, this was meant to be. <laughs> There's a lot of things in life you should try to get as much bang for your buck as possible. A medical ed education, not one of them. <laughs> you know, you, I went there and it really felt like this place was everyone's last resort. Uh, the, the students and the teachers included. Uh, just to confirm, we had this very uh, weird uh, looking lecture. His name was doc Dr. Adi Bagus. Uh, uh, you can do this after the show if you want. We Googled his name just to see what the, what the qualification, how legitimate these people that were teaching us were. And his qualifications came up further down the page. But the first thing that showed up when we Googled his name was an article saying that he was on the run from the Indonesian government <laughs> for swindling sugarcane farmers. All right, this is... <laughs> some low-level crime bullshit. Uh, he passed away recently of a heart attack. Uh, I was very surprised, because diabetes would have made much more sense. Uh, <laughs> it was a weird guy. It, it, it was strange. Like, it, it made sense that a scumbag like that would be doing medicine, though, at the time. Because I went into medicine thinking that it's good people that become doctors, and this is just not true. Uh, good people do things like teaching and social work. Uh, nursing even. You know, doctors are just the most competitive assholes in every school that decide to congregate later in life. This is professional sports for virgins. That's what it is. Uh, yeah. you know, I went to this place. It was in Malaysia. Malaysia was a very interesting place to go to school. It was a very conservative country, even more so than Sri Lanka. That's not great to begin with. You know, I met the bravest people I've known in my entire life in Malaysia. I met gay Malaysians because it's illegal to be gay in Malaysia. It's illegal for them just to be who they are which is the most gangster shit I have heard in my entire life. I had friends that walked around every day like, nah, I don't commit crimes, I am a crime. What you gonna fucking do? That's an intense individual. That's a lot to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I had a friend, his name was Ozzy. Uh, 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 so Malaysia is on, uh, on the border with Singapore. So every weekend, he would take three, four hour bus rides into Singapore just to be able to meet people, have relationships, live a normal life as he should. Uh, it was amazing, the confidence on this guy just trafficking his penis across state lines. <laughs> it was wild. Just risking going to jail to get some dick. It was amazing. And he was so confident, even if he got caught, he would have done great in jail. He, he would make a sitcom about his life, call it Rainbow is the New Black, I'd watch the fuck out of it, it would be amazing. I wouldn't fare nearly as well in, in incarceration. My only hope of surviving in that environment would be to get a little hat and be everyone's spiritual leader. Just go around saying things like, nah, my brother, the real prison is in your mind. <laughs> Four hours on a bus to get some dick. That, I must say, that must have been some truly amazing dick on the other side of that border. At four hours on a bus, I don't have one hour on a train dick on a good day, all right? I'm not, I'm not being modest. I'm just aware of how averagely endowed I am. You know, my dick is like a, like a white basketball player. You know, he's not the biggest guy on the team, but he tries real hard. <laughs> he's got strong fundamentals, and most importantly, he loves the game. Is... <laughs> that is your one dick joke for the evening, people. <laughs> uh, 
He was from a very conservative family, my friend. Uh, so uh, now that he was away from home, he'd just say the wildest things, completely out of context. I think just because he felt free to do so for the first time. Like, we'd be having dinner together as a group, and he'd just randomly say something like, you know, I like Chinese boys because their little dicks don't hurt my asshole. Um, <laughs> That was a lot. I didn't know how to take that. Like, is it homophobic if I think that's racist? What are the rules in this situation? How does this work exactly? <laughs> you know, I felt bad for him. Though, that, that even at home, he, he couldn't be himself. Even his parents weren't accepting of who he was. Now, that's one thing I did get, I feel like I got lucky with with my parents. That as much trouble as they gave me, they were very uh, liberal people, especially for the region of the world that we grew up in. Uh, my mother a little bit too much, if anything. Uh, I remember when I was like 14 years old, we were in the, in the car together, waiting to pick my sister up from somewhere. And she just started asking me like, hey, you know, I've noticed that I don't really see you hanging out with girls at school very often. And I was just like, leave me alone. I have nothing, I have nothing to tell you. Because I very much knew why this was the case. I played the flute and my sport of choice was archery. All right? <laughs> I was not doing myself any favors. <laughs> and she, she continued. She was like, yo, you know, if there's anything, if there's anything you need to tell me, anything at all, even if you're, even if you're you know. What, you want me to come out as uncharismatic? What do you want from me? Leave me alone. <laughs> this is... <laughs> Uh, she was very understanding that when I didn't continue doing medicine, though, uh, I, I finished the degree, but I, I found another job. I work in software engineering now uh, because cause I'm very committed to being a cultural stereotype, apparently. Uh, uh, a lot of the family was very upset that they no longer had a doctor to brag tell the relatives about. But my mother was real nice about it, mostly because she still uses me for free medical advice because this woman is too cheap to go see a real doctor. Uh, and it's fine most of the time. Uh, except for one instance where she thought it would be a good idea to ask her son about her contraceptive options. <laughs> because boundaries, what are those, you know? Is, you know, the subtext of which being a mother asking her son, hey son, I want to start fucking again. <laughs> I need you to help me do this safely. Listen, if this is what progress looks like, I don't like it, all right? I, don't, I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> No, I just went along, I, I went into doctor work mode in my head and just, just took a full medical history from her. And she has a family history of venous thromboembolism. So my mother's on the copper coil, people. Uh, it's, <laughs> this is definitely breaking my Hippocratic oath, but also that's for paying customers only. This is, <laughs> this is public domain now. Education's important, you know. I'm educated. I, uh, I graduated college, I got a degree in journalism, and uh, very quickly got a job as a busboy at Denny's. <laughs> I did, I did, yeah, I was a, yeah, I was a, I was a waiter before I went to college, and I came out a busboy. Okay. If I would've gone to grad school, I am pretty sure I could've made dishwasher. I think I could've done it. I mean, I, I'm college educated, but a lot of times you wouldn't know it. I have done some really dumb stuff. Like, lately, this summer, I started the summer off dumb. I can't top it. Here's what happened, I was at my brother's house, and there was like a, there's like a barbecue there. You had all his friends there, and everybody's inside, and I walked outside, and there was some bug spray on the picnic table, and I started spraying myself, and my sister-in-law walked out. She goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm putting bug spray on, Kelly. She goes, no. I'm like, I'll pay for my part of the bug spray if it's a problem, Kelly. She goes, that's not bug spray. I'm like, what is it? She goes, that's the fogger. I'm like, what's the fogger? If you... If you guys don't know what the fogger is, it's this thing where like one person puts on a hazmat suit, they evacuate the area, they spray the back lawn with the fogger, and then bugs die for a 55 mile radius. I, I put it on my face, all right? Like, a lot out of my mouth, so I have six months to live. The, the good news is those six months will be insect free. No bugs will come anywhere near me, or can hire me. I just go to people's houses now, and I sit down, and all the bugs die. I, I killed a cat, I didn't mean to. It, it jumped in my lap. I didn't. I don't know how I'm gonna top that this summer. Maybe eat a citronella candle. Here's the thing. I should have known because I remember, like, right before I sprayed myself, I, I, I remember looking at the bug spray and I was like, "That doesn't look like a normal bug spray can. It look the spout looks too wide. It looks it looks like an air horn." At that point, I should have read the label, but I was like, no, it's probably like a half, 
air horn, half bug spray product. Something you would use at an outdoor sporting event, you know? Like, you know, like, shh, 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 That's the dumbest thing I've done. Now, the dumbest thing I said, I, I was at my friend's house, and I was in the bathroom, and there was this painting in the bathroom, and in the bottom left-hand corner, it had these pencil markings. It said 23 slash 100. That means that's the 23rd print that they made of that painting in a series of 100. The people at the party had to tell me that, because I walked outside and I said, hey, I like that painting in your bathroom. I don't know why the teacher gave that guy 23 out of 100. I would've given him like a 98. I mean, yeah, sure the sun is off center, but you don't take off 77 points for something like that. I'm gonna be talking about race. And I never used to have to do that when I came on stage, but over the last couple of years, people get very sensitive if you bring up the issue of race or racism or racial rhetoric. You have people like Lawrence Fox who say stuff like, you know what, maybe if we stop talking about it, it would go away. When has that ever worked for any social ill or personal ailment you've ever have? If you went to a doctor and was like, there's a rash on my genitals, and he said, ignore that shit. You would say, I'd like another doctor, please. I also notice people always say, oh, here we go, you liberals, always whining. First of all, I'm not liberal. I will kick your mum in the face. If you're racist, second of all, uh, how can you be called a snowflake if you're liberal or care about other people? Like, when you think about the nature of a snowflake, you can't describe me in that way. Like, what's a snowflake? Individual, white and cold as fuck, <laughs> and tend to disappear in warm climates when black people are having a good time. <laughs> Couldn't be further from the truth. But mainly when I try to talk about issues that affect this society where race is concerned, people say, oh, you seem very angry. You must have a chip on your shoulder. And I thought a lot about this chip on my shoulder. And in this world of body positivity, when we're embracing all of our curves and our flaws, I embrace having a chip on my shoulder as a black man in a racist society. <laughs> keeps me alert, keeps me alive, keeps me working for a better world. And I'm gonna share this lovely chocolate chip of mine with you guys. So I hope you're ready for some lovely social commentary cookies. Now, I'm calling them social commentary cookies, yes. I could call them home truths, but that tends to put people off when you tell them the truth. You know why? Because normally you go on a website and at the beginning it doesn't say, hey, we're gonna put a piece of coding into your computer so we can monitor all of your browsing activity and sell your data to other houses and maybe, you know, keep that for ourselves. Because we'd go, oh, well, I don't consent to this, that's kind of invasive. No, thank you. So instead you go on websites and they go, hey, you like cookies? And we go, yeah, we love cookies. Give me some cookies now. So I wanted to brace you for that. Cause I get called an angry person all the time. I don't think I'm angry all the time. Just certain situations will bring out anger in anybody. Now I know it's a comedy show and I don't want to start on a solemn tone, but I gotta tell you what happened. Um, I was attacked last week. And you don't expect to be attacked in the place you've grown up your whole life there I was, around the corner from my own mother's house. And she lives in a leafy suburb. I did not expect this to happen. But something or someone hits the back of my head. And before I could think, I've got a warm, wet liquid trickling down the back of my neck. And I thought, please don't be what I think it is. But there we were, a pigeon shit on me. <laughs> Has this ever happened to anybody else? Yeah, it's not a nice thing to happen. But was it made worse when somebody went, don't worry, that's good luck. <laughs> I'm sorry, when did feces and fortune become bedfellows? <laughs> There's nothing lucky about shit. In fact, shit is the opposite of luck. When you're not lucky, you go, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> now, I think we can test this theory. Anyone here ever bought a lottery ticket or a scratch card? Yeah, hoping to be lucky. Yeah, but you didn't wipe your bum with it before the numbers came out. <laughs> Because there's nothing lucky about shit. <laughs> nothing lucky about being shat on. Now, I want to make sure we've made the distinction between the words shit and shat. Because those carry two very different meanings. Because if someone says to you, hey, 
a shit in your house. You'd be like, okay, bit too much information. You can just say I go into the toilet. Anyway, that's fine. I hope you've washed your hands. But if someone says, hey, I shat in your house. There's a feeling it's still there. Now you gotta buy a new rug. And get some new friends. So anyway, this pigeon shit on me, I was pissed off. And I decided to declare war on this pigeon and all of his kind. But then I thought, what a hypocrite. You can't blame an entire group or community for the actions of an individual. I'm not Liam Neeson or a metropolitan police officer. So, can't do that. So, I thought the best thing to do would be to empathize and think about myself as a pigeon. And when I thought about it, you know what? Pigeons have a rough time in our society. Some of you might remember that pigeons used to exchange messages during the war. You know, when people ate licorice still. And they would exchange messages between the allies, helping us to defeat the Nazis. I say defeat, making a move to America. But the point is that pigeons helped out. Now, pigeons live like war veterans. They got limbs missing, no access to healthcare. They're homeless, congregating under bridges. It's tough when you're a pigeon. Not only that, when you're a pigeon, you're considered a second-class citizen to your white counterpart, the dove. <laughs> Did you even know that doves are just white pigeons? And they get all the good songs, all for the wings of a dove, when doves cry. There's no good pigeon songs. <laughs> Black people are like, there's one pigeon song. It's not positive. <laughs> and speaking from personal experience, when you've contributed to the infrastructure of a society and that society turns around and neglects your efforts, sometimes you gotta do wild shit so people pay attention. Maybe that's why that pigeon shouted me. And then when he went back to the Black Birds Matter rallies, they had a conversation about it. Cause I assume all the black birds kinda get together. One of the more radical birds takes the stage. We'll call him Falcon X. And no one else is doing bird pan-Africanist puns, shut up. So anyway, Falcon X comes on stage and he's like, this is some bullshit, I'ma keep shitting on them until they stop eating our eggs. Then one of the more moderate pigeons will call him Martin Koo, the king. He, <laughs> he's like, not all human beings are bad. Sometimes when you go to the park, they will give you breadcrumbs. And he's like, they also take breadcrumbs and they roll our legs in that and they fucking eat it. What are you talking about, mine? <laughs> like, even the fact that we call pigeons flying rats which is a derogatory term only to the black urban pigeons, mind you. Because when it comes to rats, there's also iniquity there. When you're a white rat, I'm not saying your life is perfect, but it could be worse. You get to work in a lab, free cosmetics, <laughs> healthcare, <laughs> exercise in a maze. When you're a black rat, what do you get? Blame for the plague. Or if you're a brown rat, you gotta do youth work in a sewer, teaching turtles kung fu and shit. That's no kind of life. Doesn't just happen on land either. This shit is taking place in the sea too. Some of you will be familiar with the species Orcus orca, known in documentaries as the blackfish, but more commonly known as a killer whale. All these fish in the sea and the predominantly black one is called a killer. Is that fair? Why can't they be called sea pandas? I'm just saying that killer whales look more like pandas than sea lions look like lions. Like think about how we revere and look at lions. King of the savannah plains. Even lion kings. There's no sea lion king because it don't look like a fucking lion. Can you imagine the first time a kid was told they was gonna meet an underwater lion, how disappointing that would have been? <laughs> Marine biologist comes home, he's like, hey there, son. I know I haven't been around as much as I should have been, but daddy's got a surprise for you. We finally discovered a new species, a sea lion, son. Dad, are you fucking serious? You guys have discovered a motherfucking sea lion? I don't really care for your language, son, but yeah, that's... <laughs> My fault for not being there, I guess. But yeah, son, that's what happens. So now they get down to the lab and he's like, behold, son, in all of nature's majesty, a sea lion. Kid's like, what the fuck is this? 
it's a sea lion, son. It's an otter with a fucking wax. You should have called it a sea badger. Don't you get tired of disappointing me, motherfucker? <laughs> Meanwhile, the biggest killer in the sea gets to enjoy the name Great White Shark. And all we do is talk about its greatness and its whiteness. Should be called a colonial fish, if you ask me. Out here just taking over. So when David Attenborough's on Blue Planet, he's like, since ancient times, the great white shark has been one of history's greatest hunters and most efficient killers. But we want to know, what's its secret? Oh, I know, privilege! <laughs> Now you can tell me guys, did that seem kind of angry? Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Well, that's fine. Some of you say yeah, some of you say no. Well, I'll put that down to the fact that rarely do black people in our community get to explore the entirety of our emotional spectrum. It's not just from zero to anger all the time. There's a sliding scale. Also, just because we raise our voices doesn't mean we're angry. If you learn nothing else today, moving forward, Think of black shouting the same way you think about white women's tears. In that sometimes when we do it, we're in a good mood. And also sometimes it's the only recourse of action you have for people to pay attention to your needs. And finally, black people and white women telling us to calm down does not help. Yeah. So now you have that understanding, let me give you an idea of the sliding scale. We all get angry sometimes. And I don't go from zero to 10, it's a scale. So like one for me would be like, you know when you go into a room in the dark or you're not looking and you stub your toe on some furniture, but it's so painful, you're like, someone is trying to kill me in my own home. <laughs> Cause once I went into my nephew's bedroom, he had a Buzz Lightyear on the floor, I stepped on it and I was so angry. I was like, I wish this was Toy Story and you could come to life. Cause I fucking kill you, Buzz. <laughs> right, just show you halfway up the scale. I have a condition called misphonia. It means certain sounds make me very sensitive, like snoring or loud chewing. And I'm telling you this because I had to move out of my housemate's flat. I was living with a housemate, I had to find my own flat because this guy would make so much noise when he was eating because he refused to go to the dentist. I would fantasize about slitting his throat so he could bleed out all over the table. Now, be honest with me guys, does that seem kind of dramatic? Some say yeah, some say no. To those of you that say yeah, let me ask you a question. Who the fuck chews soup? <laughs> My housemate, that's fucking who. Yeah. Now, I wanted to give you an idea of what makes me angry. And I'm imagining some of you are like, well, based on what he's saying, then racism must be level 10 for Dane. But you'd be incorrect. Most people of color can tell you we are so used to discrimination, it's become part of the atmosphere. It's something you have to consider in every activity you do. Anything you do, you gotta think about how it's gonna affect you as a person of color in Western civilization. So I would say no, racism is not a 10 for me, it's more like an eight or a nine. 10 for me would be people still denying that racism exists. And those people are still out there. And some of them are black and brown people too, trying to find work and avoid getting shape ups at barbershops. The point is, <laughs> thank you black people that got that. <laughs> but the point is that, you know, can we still deny the existence of racism in a post camera phone society, in a world where there are two men called Rage Charles and Stevie Wonder, who between both those guys have written at least three songs about racism. So if a blind man can see it, it must really exist. Some of you are like, but my brown friend says, your brown friend can't play the piano with his fucking eyes closed. <laughs> so I know that the conversation about privilege is a hard one to have, because you live in a capitalist society where you're told you gotta work for everything, be a part of this rap race, and for you to win, someone lazier than you has to lose. You've all got the same 24 hours. <laughs> right, to get out there and do some work. So if it's gonna ease this conversation somewhat, I am now on stage prepared to discuss some aspects of black privilege. Would you like that? Yeah. Well, it don't fucking exist. How dare you? Not shy, lady. I laid the trap. You sprung it. Did you see that shit? <laughs> Sorry, mysterious racist in the shadows. I'll set you up there. Uh... <laughs> I also.
also got into watching this show alone. Has anybody, you like that show? Fuck yeah. Yeah, if you don't know what Alone is, this show's fucking awesome. It's, it's awesome. I love Alone. It's the best show. It's so fucking good. If you don't know, Alone is a show where they take like 10 survivalists and they drop them in the middle of a hopeless area. It could be the Canadian Arctic. It could be a swamp in Arkansas. It could be Newark. And they leave them there. <laughs> and... And then they have to like survive as long as they can, building their own huts and, and hunting their own food and everything. It's amazing. It's it is it's basically the Great British Baking Show, but for people with outstanding warrants. Like it, it's for criminals, like hideaways and whatnot. It's awesome. My favorite part about this show is that they go like they, in the intro. They go alone. Our contestants must live as primitive man did. And they're right. Oh boy, they nailed it. Yeah, it's exactly like Primitive Man. If Primitive Man were given a small porn production's allotment of camera equipment to drag through the woods with them, 10 survival items of their choosing to start with, and a satellite phone with a panic button that summons a boat filled with antibiotics and rescue workers that whisks them away to a Denny's at the first sign of trouble. But aside from that, it is the Paleolithic period out there. Just those minute little details. I love these shows. Like I've got so, I've watched every season of Naked and Afraid. I've watched all of like, I love shows like Project Alaska and stuff like that. But I realized it's because I'm a nature cuck. Like legitimately a nature cuck. Like, cause there is nothing I love more than to sit in the corner of a room and watch as Mother Nature fucks my fellow man right in front of me. I love to watch it. I just sit there and I'm like, yeah, fuck him real good, Mother Nature. Yeah, he's got a cut on his finger he got this morning chopping wood. Yeah, I bet that's gonna get infected, isn't it? Oh, and I bet he's got a fever right now, doesn't he? Now drop a blizzard on his ass, mommy. <laughs> I fucking love, I love this shit. It makes me so fucking, it makes me so happy. It's just so good. I love all of this stuff. I love, I just think it is so funny that people believe that it is a child, like this childlike level of delusion to believe that we can go back to primitive living. There are seven billion of us on the planet, 330 million Americans. We cannot agree on everything or anything at all. <laughs> and you think we can go back to the most primitive and difficult way of living? You're crazy. I, I love when people say they're paleo because it's code. Whenever a buddy is like, yo, I went paleo. I'm like, oh, I know what you mean. You mean you don't want to eat tomatoes or listen to women. That's what you mean. <laughs> That's all you mean. Like, paleo people are like, all they mean is they're just like, yeah, bro, I'm paleo now. Oh, yeah, I'm paleo, I do it. That's the craziest, the Paleolithic period was like two million years long. It extended over such a long and vast time span and area. There were so many different, and the best part is, Paleo people take it as, I get to eat meat three meals a day. That's basically what it means. Do you know now that they think that hunting for big game was a mating ritual because it was so fruitless? That was such a difficult thing to do. Big game was very difficult to come by. Most people just foraged for everything. That's why just once I wanna hear somebody go, we went paleo, whole family. And they actually went paleolithic. <laughs> like they're like, yeah, whole family went paleo. Great, so you're having bison with every meal now? No, 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 no. Most of my protein is coming from uh, spiders that I dig out of the corner of the shed. <laughs> And I'm getting a fair amount of my greens that grow up as dandelions around the walkway. I'm not gonna lie to you, I've had a urinary tract infection for the last three straight months. And seven of our first 10 kids died in childbirth. It's not easy, I'll tell you that. It's not easy, it's a sacrifice. That's why I'm three feet, seven inches tall. <laughs> Fucking dumbasses. We're this tall cause of corn. Corn did this. And not the band, that would be sweet. 
God, if the band Corn was responsible for our development. <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> I, my buddy is always trying to get me to take primitive survival classes. He's like, dude, you want to come and take some outdoor survival classes? No. <laughs> what, you don't want to? No. Oh, all right, bro, I thought you said you wanted simpler living. Yeah, I meant I want to read more and I don't want to wash my face at night, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but I don't want to fight raccoons for my food. Are you fucking crazy? <laughs> Look at me, I'm an indoor girl. This is what it looks like. <laughs> I'm American. Without my Pontiac G6 and my condominium, I am just an unpeeled banana, just loudly stomping through the woods at a profoundly trackable rate. Like, you'd be amazed at how quickly an animal could eat me. They're gonna eat me first. I'm already in the posture of a corn dog. Look at me. I'm an upright walking stick of meat. I'm definitely gonna get fucking eaten. It's, that's why I love shows. Don't put Americans on survival shows. We're the Fabergé eggs of this fucking planet. We are the most delicate, needy group of people on this planet. That's why I love this show, because I love seeing the hubris of Americans when they get on this show. They're always like, I'm gonna make this landscape my bitch. <laughs> I ain't afraid of no bears or no wolves. See, we've all seen too many movies about the outdoors. We've seen The Revenant or The Grey or whatever. We've seen movies. We think you're gonna get eaten by mountain lions. It's not. In the wild, it's the little shit that kills you. And that's what I realized from the show. Like, I watched an episode of Alone One Night where a field mouse took a man for everything it was fucking worth. <laughs> And it was the greatest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. It was so good. This big gruff guy from Montana's in his shed and he wakes up in the morning and he opens up his food store and he's like, oh shit, oh my God. All my blueberries I harvested are gone. What the fuck? And he looks out the door and there's this fat little field mouse sitting there covered in blueberries and shit. Just scowling at him and he's like, what the fuck? And he runs and it takes off. And so the next day, this guy gets up and he goes back to his food and he's like, fuck! It ain't half of my chanterelles! Oh my God, what the, f and he looks out and there's that mouse again. Cheeks stuffed full of mushrooms, just scowling at him. And so he's like, I gotta do something about this. This thing is gonna, he's, I'm gonna starve. So the guy makes a trap and he hangs a little bit of his meat in the trap and he goes to bed. And in the morning, he checks the trap and the trap is still set, and the meat is still hanging there. But in the hardest rodent flex of all time, <laughs> he noticed that the mouse just chewed all of the fat off of the meat. <laughs> and did not trip the trap. And this man went full PTA mom. It was amazing. <laughs> His voice got shrill and he was like, no! You're a mouse, you stay outside, and if you come inside, I humanely trap you, and I put you outside, thus allowing karma to shine down on me. That's the way it works. And this mouse was sitting out there like, I ain't your typical bitch city mouse, am I? I came out here to do two things. That's fuck and chew the fat off stuff. And my wife didn't want to fuck this morning. So it looks like you're up to bat, you pink disappointment. <laughs> and that guy just leaned on a log and was like, oh my God, he started crying. <laughs> he started crying. It was so good. The mouse actually looked like it felt bad for him. Like the mouse was like, oh, come on, man. I didn't do you that bad. Last guy they dropped off out here, I ate his entire King James Bible in front of him. <laughs> it took me two fucking weeks to get through. I didn't even like the taste. I just loved to listen to him scream at the moon every night. I love this show because you can tell when they're gonna tap out every fucking time. Because there's one word 
If you watch alone, there's one word that tells you they're going to tap out. You'll hear it. They'll be down. They'll be sitting there on a log, 40 pounds lighter, just like <laughs> shaking. And they're like, I can't do it anymore. And then you'll hear, I just want a donut. And that's it. That's the out. <laughs> the minute the human brain goes to donut, you're fucked. That's it. Give up. Because a donut, the thought of a donut is universal acid. It'll chew through your will and drive. You just want a donut so bad. That's why we can't go back. Because there's no going back from donuts. There's only forward from donuts. And even if you don't like a donut, which I don't want to know you if you don't, you love what a donut stands for. Hot, ready-made trash at our beck and call. <laughs> None of us can go back to primitive life because we've all had pizza. <laughs> You've all had broccoli at any time of year that snaps fresh from the stock. You've all had a kombucha. <laughs> you can't go back from that. So the best thing you can do is be kind to each other, grab some neck feathers on this albatross, and ride this shit bird down until it dies from all the plastic it accidentally ingested. Yeah. Because if you haven't got hip to it yet, we're all gonna fucking die out here! Let's have fun while we're at it! And then we'll have woke airlines. A little different, a little softer. You walk down the tunnel, right? There's just a person standing there. You're not quite sure. You're looking for a clue one way or the other. You, know? you don't want to be rude. You don't want to make a mistake, but can't see a breast, not sure. You know, like... And they're just like, hi, my name is... My pronouns are nosotros vosotros. <laughs> Welcome to Woke Airlines. If you can have your N95 mask over all of your orifices. <laughs> Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, asshole, please. There's some future variants that could happen any moment, any time. Please stand 100 feet apart. We need half of the line outside the airport, please. Before we board, this plane will be taking off only after everyone has watched this 15-hour video from the CDC. <laughs> we take it very seriously. Also, there are no sections on this flight. Okay, we don't want to elevate anyone over anyone else. You're all equal, okay? There's no seats on this flight. <laughs> we don't anyone to feel they have a better seat than someone else. This is an equitable flying experience. Nobody's elevated or above anyone else. So can you guys just figure out a way to get on the plane yourselves? We do have a few seats for pets. If you want to seat your pet, we will seat a pet. And when you do find a place on the plane that you agree amongst yourself is good for both of you, please everyone sit Indian style to honor that culture. I'm sorry, did I just say Indian saw? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! I'm sorry, I'm a notice, I'm a notice, I'm a notice, I'm a notice! I am so sorry. If there's any BIPOC people out there, I apologize, please. I meant native. If there's any, please sit native style. I apologize, that was privilege that came through. That was my privilege. I am listening now, I'm an ally, I apologize. Please accept my resignation from this airplane. I am receding to give somebody else an opportunity who's of purer spirit. As I told you, there's no sections on this flight. All your flights cost the same. They were all the same amount, okay? No price was above any other price. We've taken all the money from all your plane tickets, pooled it up, and redistributed it to social services. So this is actually our last flight. We're going out of business, but... Please hashtag you were here and how good you felt about it. Making a difference. 
we have 86 bathrooms on this flight. One for whatever your preferred pronoun is. We're constantly building new bathrooms every year to accommodate the ever-expanding list of pronouns that come into existence. We have he, him, she, her, vosotros, nosotros, they, them, there, those, he, ha, zuby, newby. If we have not built your preferred pronoun bathroom yet, we do have these temporary non-binary diapers. You can go in until that bathroom is constructed. Our entertainer for this flight will just be checking in on AOC's Instagram live feed. And we only have one rule for this flight, and I'm sorry, it applies to you, sir. There are no straight white men allowed on this flight. Beat it. You might want to go down to the next terminal to Nazi Airlines. I thought I was gonna be like a millionaire trillionaire. Cause I'm like, you know what they need to do? They need to put a snap here. And then uh, I'm gonna put a snap at the back. If I could just find a way to snap these two together. I'm gonna be a, like, I was like, oh man. Come out of the bathroom, tell my wife that story. I'm like, I just invented this thing. It's gonna be a button. I'm gonna snap it. It's gonna like that. We're gonna be millionaires. My wife goes, did you date anybody in the 80s? Nothing's ever enough for America. Nothing. There is an American flag on the moon. There is an American flag on the moon. I mean, if there's one thing in life that can't be claimed, surely it's the moon, but no, moon's American. Makes sense, of course the moon's American. It's white, it's round. It's inexplicably involved in women's reproductive organs. Yeah, it makes sense. And so I have like four old dude male comic friends who I swear to God are nice enough guys. But, uh, <laughs> but they have recently said to me that uh, you can't even flirt anymore, man. You can't even flirt. You talk to a woman, she thinks you're harassing her. And I have this to say, are you sure you're flirting? Because I've never flirted in my life. I am married, but not because of any interpersonal skills, right? I'm married because of online dating. Online dating is the last bastion of you can go somewhere and look at each other and both of you go, well, I would make out with that. Would you make out with this? And then you move forward from there. And that's why I'm married. Prior to internet dating, I had two ways of hitting that guys, and one of them was stone cold sober if I liked a guy. I would stand next to him for years. <laughs> Absolutely never successful. Second way, uh, I'd get liquored up. I'd go to the bar, I'd walk up to any promising dude and go, this needs a tune up, you want in? <laughs> Neither one of those is flirting. One of them is harassment. <laughs> Right here. How do we know? How do we know? Because of how the men would respond. That's how we know. Almost all of them said, ew, no. And then some of them said, sure? We then proceeded to have what can only be called consensual, but regrettable sex. I don't know if you've had much regrettable consensual sex, but it's mediocre, my friends. It wasn't great. The only thing I ever did with it was we used a condom. Big fan of the condom. The youngest of six can't possibly be dropping babies around this country. And of course, the clap. Uh, but it was weird. Sometimes uh, men would say, a guy, a fella might say, I don't want to use a condom. Does it feel as good? I don't want to use a condom. And then I would say back, does it feel better than not any sex at all? Uh, so those are your two options. And then we would then proceed to have sex with a condom because we had both already settled, you guys. But my favorite was a guy who said, I don't want to use a condom. Does it feel as good? Don't you trust me? No. We went 35 minutes ago to bowling out. I trust you not to kill me in the next seven to 11 minutes. <laughs> and then I looked up the definition of flirting. Flirting is harassment. That's the definition. It's either successful harassment or unsuccessful harassment. 
the best definition of flirting I read was this one. An interaction with another person wherein you make the other person feel good about themselves. Ooh. <laughs> who's doing that? <laughs> and then I realized who's doing that, and it's my dad. <laughs> my father is an aluminum siding salesman, though vinyl is vinyl, steel is for real. Uh, <laughs> Still selling, LA vacation, Milwaukee, windows, doors, anything you need, roofing. Uh, but uh, I, I recently found out that he hit on one of my best friends, Maria Bamford, at my wedding. Now, in his defense, at my wedding, Maria Bamford was a tiny 35-year-old blonde woman, which is his favorite kind of person. Uh, but she told me this, and I was like, I'm so sorry. And she said, don't be sorry. He didn't touch me. He didn't even say anything weird. I just got the impression that he thought I was pretty. I was like, that's that crazy definition of flirting. How did he do it? She goes, I have no idea. So the last time I was home, I had, I had dinner with my dad, and then I had breakfast with my dad. And at breakfast, I said, you hit on Maria Bamford using some weird skill. What was it? He was like, it's a sales technique, Jackie. It's called the post-close warm-up. I've been trying to teach all you kids how to do it since you were born. Is anyone listening to me? He said, I hit on the waitress. We went out to dinner last night. We hit on the waitress last night using the post clothes warm-up. You were there. And I was like, I remember you hitting on the waitress, Dad. I also remember it not being successful. And he goes, it's not always going to be successful. It's a waitress. That is a hostage situation. She keeps going away. You can't build any kind of momentum. But you got to practice on someone. By the way, going to dinner with your 84-year-old father in Milwaukee, we're talking Outback, 4.30. Okay. <laughs> the waitress came to the table. My father looked at the waitress and said, you are very good looking. You look very familiar. Are you an actress? You are very good looking. You look very familiar. Are you an actress? And she said, no, no, I'm a waitress. <laughs> what would you like to drink? He got the coffee. She goes away. She comes back. My dad goes, you just seem so familiar to me. I feel a connection with you. Maybe we've met before. And she goes, maybe. I made a lot of people. What would you like to eat? Uh, he got the steak. She goes away. She comes back at the end of the meal. My father goes, well, it's been very nice meeting you. I hope I see you around again. And she goes, maybe. Here's the bill. Now, there are three beats to this thing. The first beat you say in a non-threatening general way, well played. Nice work. Uh, second beat, you say, I feel a connection with you. I'm kind of sorry we've never met before. Third beat, my dad's like, very important. Third beat, you gotta let it go. Gotta let it go. You give it a shot. You say, well, it's been very nice meeting you. I hope I see you around again. If she's interested, she will talk more to you. You will start another round, and eventually, you will sell that woman windows. <laughs> my father a great deal and if you were to look at him objectively actually I don't recommend that <laughs> I recommend you look at him subjectively through the love in my eyes because he's very smart he's very good with money he's very he loves talking to people actually like three weeks ago he calls me up and he's like so I'm watching TV and at the commercial there's an opportunity to get a free hundred dollar square pillow I was like yeah he goes, yeah. So I called him up and I was like, I'd like my free square pillow. And he said, well, give us your information. I did. I hung up. Moments later, guy calls back, different guy, to sell me a $6,000 electric bed. And I was like, yeah, that's what that's for, Dad. He's like, I know, I know. I talked to him for like 90 minutes. And um, <laughs> it was great, $6,000 electric bed. Talked him down to $3,600. And... Uh, and then he finally said, he said, you know, give me $100 over the phone and then send me $100 a month. We'll bring the bed over to your apartment. And I said, you know, I'm 84. I'm going in tomorrow for a heart surgery. If I live, I'll call you back. Click. So <laughs> he's like, the guy was a pretty good salesman. I think I saved like three old people having to talk to that guy. <laughs> he's very good at a lot of different things. Like he's, uh, my brother Russ, who lives in Milwaukee, hangs out with him all the time. He's like, sometimes dad will tell me that if I get a certain stock in like a week and a half, I can turn it around and make like 10 grand. And I remember the first time he told me that, I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you should, don't bother though. And my brother Russ is like, why wouldn't I, no, I, I want to make 10,000, why wouldn't I do that? He's like, well, there's not really fun in that. It's, uh... <laughs> Because you could make $250,000 if you invest in this other stock and some sort of mouse trappy kind of Rube Goldberg thing happened where like a swan came by and rolled in a bowling ball. You could make like $250,000. And uh, my brother Russ goes, I think I'm just going to do the $10,000 thing, Dad. 
<laughs> and my dad's like, eh, it's boring, but okay. <laughs> so he's done it like six times and he has like a Scrooge McDuck pile of money. And I was like, hey, Russ, you got five siblings over here. When dad tells you something like that, why don't you call the rest of us? And my brother Russ goes, why don't you call your dad more often? <laughs> he's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> I did call my dad not long ago and I was talking to him and I said, I'm just, just making conversation. And I said, I turned down a gig. And he goes, you just turned it down. And I said, yeah, didn't want to do it, dad. And he goes, what was the first thing I taught you? And I was mad because I didn't like his tone of voice. And so I said, I don't know, pick up other people's change. And um, he became very angry since he's never said that. He said, no, the first thing I taught you all was never say no without a number. And I was like, that does sound familiar. What the heck does it mean? He goes, you don't say no. You say, I'd love to do that. I'm going to need, and then you pick a giant number. And I was like, 17 grand. He's like, that's a good number. He's like, odd number, strong. He's like, I would, he's like, I would love to do that. I'm going to need $17,000. And then they say, oh my gosh, we don't have $17,000. And then you say back, well, thank you so much for thinking of me. If your budget ever goes up, keep me in mind, but know that my prices are always rising. So you can turn it down in perpetuity and uh, I was like that's the greatest thing in the world I'm totally gonna do that and I tried to do it and I did it wrong I asked for two thousand dollars and I got it so uh, I called my dad and I said never say no without a number didn't work dad and he goes yeah every experience is a learning experience what'd you ask for and I said two grand he said no you know what you learned Everyone has two grand. <laughs> yes. And now I have two grand, but I have to go to Montana in February. <laughs> My dad is very much an old school capitalist, right? He thinks that there's like, there are tools on the table. You either use them or they get used against you. Actually, in his case, there's a third option. He is bored and he uses them on your behalf. It is a lot like trying to iron something poorly in front of your mother, and then she takes the iron and does it for you. That's what happened. My dad lives in what he calls an old people apartment building. And I was like, Dad, you're 84. What's old to you? And he goes, dead. Dead is old. Any day of the week, you can get a free DVD player in this building. And, uh... He, he says, okay, so I'm walking by the common area, and inside the common area, there's an old guy, like 94, 95 years old. He had just gotten out of the hospital. He had just had surgery, and he has Medicare. He has secondary insurance, but he was kind of freaking out. He was almost crying because he had gotten two more bills, one from the hospital, one from the surgeon for more money for like 30 grand, 35 grand, and he was kind of, he was really upset. My dad pauses, and he goes, can you believe people think they got to pay hospital bills? <laughs> I was like, yeah, they're bills. People pay bills. And he's like, not a hospital. You die on a hospital money, that's a win right there. You send them five bucks a month, you're trying. They can't do anything. Can't put a lien on anything or garnish your wages. And if that hospital gets any kind of federal funding, they have to do a certain amount of sliding fee scale billing. They don't want to give you the paperwork, but eventually, I'm like, pardon me, Mr. Incredible, while I take notes <laughs> and tell several hundred people in Minnesota. You ever see The Incredibles? The most heroic moment of The Incredibles was when that guy finds that paperwork for that old lady. And the rest of the movie, quite nice. But that movie, heroic. Okay. My dad says, I can't handle it. So I go in and I tell the guy, I'm like, get the bills, get your checkbook, we'll come into my apartment, we'll take care of this. So they go back into my dad's apartment and then my dad gets to call the hospital billing. Fun! It's his favorite thing. So he calls the hospital billing and he's talking to this woman. He's like, I'm talking to this woman and I was like, so my buddy owes you $17,000. I'm sitting next to him. You're never gonna see this money. <laughs> and the hospital billing lady's like, but he, he was in the hospital. And my dad's like, you've already been paid twice. Medicare, secondary insurance, you're triple dipping. I'm sitting right next to him. He's not gonna make it. <laughs> he's barely sitting up. He was in the hospital just a minute ago. Did you know that? The woman goes, he's not going to make it? Well, just, could he give us like $600 over the phone with a routing number and then we'll, we'll write it off? And my dad's like, yeah, we could totally do that. So they give him a routing number and my, they hang up. And my dad goes, now we're going to go talk to the, uh, to the surgeon. He's right here in Milwaukee. I'll drive. Lincoln Town Car, 99. Uh, they get into the car at around 4.30 in the afternoon on a Thursday. They drive to the surgeon's office. And my dad 
goes into the surgeon's office. He goes up to the receptionist and says, my buddy owes you 15 grand. He's here. He's got his checkbook. We'd love to talk to the surgeon. The receptionist is like, please come and sit down. So it's five to five on a Thursday. And my dad is like, starts in with the, with the surgeon. He's like, yeah, you're never going to see this. Money. Sit, look at this guy. He can barely sit up. He just had surgery. And the surgeon's like, but I did the surgery. He's like, you're triple dipping. You're never going to see this money. Surgeon lasted almost an hour 15. Finally said, give me $200. Get the heck out of my office. So they write the check. And they, they're driving home. And my dad goes, so we're driving home. And I say uh, to the old guy, let's stop at McDonald's and get a senior coffee. You could buy me a senior coffee. Get this. Guy would not buy me a senior coffee. 59 cent senior coffee guy wouldn't do it. And I was like, Dad, why would that guy want to spend another heartbeat with you? You just spent five hours telling anyone who would listen that he was a dead person. He's like, yeah, but I just saved him like 30 grand. And I was like, did you do it for the coffee? And he's like, yeah. I don't need to get paid a lot. I just need something. Anyway. My father is, he's a good guy. When I had breakfast with him, he said, you know, your Uncle Johnny's son Jimmy has the dream job. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm on TV sometimes, Dad. What's the, what's the dream job? And he goes, he drives a cement truck. I was like, wait, that's the dream job? And he goes, yeah, you know the truck that spins? He gets to drive that truck. I was like, yeah, that's the dream job? He said, yeah, he gets to drive up into buildings and pour cement. I'm like, wait. Driving a cement truck is the dream job. And my dad goes, it's the truck that spins, Jack. <laughs> so inside of my very sophisticated 84-year-old father is a toddler <laughs> who would desperately like to drive a concrete mixer. I have been corrected. I am going to miss some things about the pandemic, though. For example, having my temperature taken like I'm being executed. <laughs> Remember that at the restaurants? You want to see our menu? You want to see our menu, don't you, huh? You want to look at our specials? It's aggressive, you know? I didn't feel safe. I started carrying my own thermometer around with me for protection. That's my second amendment. That's my second amendment. I got the right, I got the right. So they'd be like, you want to see our menu? I'd be like, what's up now, dog? How you doing? How you doing? No, you need to give me your email. No, I'll take your email in case I have to track you like a little baby wolf. <laughs> <laughs>